Today's book explains why supply chains are hard to operate and getting harder. Fortunately, future managers can employ a combination of suitably educated employees and digital technology to successfully manage ever higher complexity. People and companies can use digital technologies to make themselves more efficient and more effective to address the expanding and changing needs of the planet. Our guest today is the author of a 1985 textbook on transportation networks and eight management books dealing with supply chain resilience, sustainability, industrial clustering, and he is the world's expert on supply chains. It is a great honor to have him on the show for a three-part series on his latest book, The Magic Conveyor Belt, Supply Chains, AI, and the Future of Work. Professor Yossi Sheffi, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Aiden. Nice to be here. It is great to have you, and you're joining us from your weekend place over in the States. We've been planning this for quite some time, and it's difficult to find time in Yossi's schedule. So (laughs) let's dive in. We're not going to waste any time. I thought we'd start with the question that might be in the minds of many of our audience if they clicked on the link, which is the whole idea of supply chain management. Really? That has something got to do with innovation, etc.? And really, like you said, many times you'd be introduced at a dinner party, you'd tell people what you do, and people would be kind of going, oh, thinking you could see the blank stares in their eyes. But COVID changed that for everybody. Yes, I always tell the, it's a true story that people until March uh, 2020, people used to ask my wife, what, you know, what's your husband doing at MIT? And she said, doing research on supply chain management. And the response was, they look like a deer in the headlight. Uh, what is this? I, a few months later, my wife walked to the local supermarket and uh, didn't have something that she wanted to buy. And she asked the uh, 17-year-old clerk why there's no oranges or whatever it was. And he says, don't you know, ma'am, we have supply chain management, we have supply chain problems. So, my, okay, that's it. <laughs> it's now there. It went from the, from the boardroom discussion to the, basically to the kitchen, uh, to the kitchen discussion. So, yeah, uh, the fact that um, there were shortages and problems, so everybody started realizing that stuff does not appear magically on the supermarket shelf or Amazon deliver it. There's a whole history. How, how does it get there? The originally, the book was written in response to people asking, actually, my wife. Uh, I, uh, she has many, many friends, and people were asking, uh, Okay, we hear about supply chain. What's going on? What is it? Uh, can you ask your husband to uh, to talk to us about it? And there, were, my options were either talking, giving a hundred one to one on one talks, or do something else. So I decided to write a book. And the beginning is our explanation of why it's so complicated, why it actually did not fail, why it was a heroic effort of people and companies and and, and collabor- in a lot of collaboration that uh, made sure that nobody went hungry, for example. Um, So explain how complex it is. And in some sense, try to bring people to the realization that if they they don't see something on the supermarket shelf or uh, Amazon is out of stock, they should not be angry or pissed off. Or in fact, if something is is on the shelf or Amazon delivery, they should be amazed and thankful if they understand how many stages it take from as a mine in China to a series of dozens of suppliers and sub suppliers, sub and transportation company and uh, um, custom regimes and tax regime going through the whole world several times over until they get a fully functional product on the shelf. And once they understand what it is, they become a amazed and a lot more forgiving <laughs> when something is not. <laughs> I wanted to ensure we're all on the same page from an audience perspective and to to understand the importance of a supply chain, not only to feed and cater for the 8 billion on the planet, but also how understanding supply chains is key to innovation and indeed efficiency. I'd love you to do us the honor of defining supply chain in its current manifestation. And uh, as you tell us, it was a a term only coined back in 1982. Yeah. Uh, look, supply chain always existed in the sense that, uh, you know, the, the joke is uh, 
a child ask, ask his parents, how did people live before oxygen was discovered? Just like oxygen, supply chain were always there. They're always there was trading, there were people, you know, making stuff. What changed is with the uh, in invention of the, of the container, with the uh, internet, with the communication, with the um, uh, maritime advancement, uh, air, air freight advancement, supply chain became global. So because it was possible to get the best supplier in the world, regardless of where they are, and that supplier will build some part that will go into some other supplier who will put it in a bigger part and put it in some other uh, element and then go and this will be assembled somewhere else into a vehicle, a blender, a toaster, whatever it is. Um, through this, because it, has, it crosses um, oceans and national boundaries, one, it's become very complex, very complicated. Just the fact that one has to coordinate with dozens and dozens of elements all the time. And as I said, actually, the amazing thing there is there is no central control. There is no czar that says, okay, you do this, you do this. Actually, the Soviet Union tried to do it, and it was a miserable failure. In the, in the free market, it is all a result of a pair of negotiation, buyer-seller, 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 and until you get to the, uh, to the finished product. So, as Adam Smith coined, they talk about the invisible hand, supply chain operation is the manifestation of the invisible hand. There are processes that go over time and space without any central control. Now, it is even harder to, for companies, let's, let's talk, for example, about an automobile company. Talk about, uh, I don't know, Renault or General Motors. Uh, it is hard for them to know who their suppliers are. Now, they know what's called tier one suppliers. They pay to certain people to do certain parts. But these people also have suppliers. And those suppliers are those. And the, the suppliers don't want to reveal to Mercedes or Renault or GM who their suppliers are because for several reasons. First of all, it's a trade secret. And second, they're afraid that the uh, OEM, the uh, automobile manufacturer, will go around them and go directly to their supplier. And try. It's, uh, so it's very hard for company to have what's called visibility into the entire supply chain, yet it works. Amazingly, it works. Now, <laughs> people are trying to solve this problem and can, uh, talk about it, but by and large, it's, uh, as I said, it's a manifestation of the invisible hand. Let's give the example. Let's build on the example of cars. I, I pulled a quote on that, and I thought this was so fascinating. It's it's the depth that you go in to to expose all this because this we just buy the products. We're just the end part of the whole supply chain. But you write here, most cars have about thirty thousand parts made around the world, with many of them traveling multiple times across and between continents. Each of the thirty thousand parts must be highly engineered composed of specific materials, carefully manufactured, and then delivered to thousands of suppliers who assemble many of these parts and send the resulting sub-assemblies to car factories. All these sub-assemblies are then put together to make a sophisticated yet affordable automobile. It really is remarkable. And maybe you'll give us an overview of, for example, the, the car, something that we take for granted. The car. So the car you have to assemble the car, they run on the production line. The car has seats, for example. This is an example I did not use in the book. The car has seats. So a company called Johnson Control is one of the leaders in making seats for car. Now, modern car, the seats come with all kind of small electric motors to move it back and forth, to uh, inflate the back, to give you lumbar support. All these are in small um, small models that um, Jones Control doesn't make. They buy them from another supplier. They also have to buy cloth or, for example, either uh, cloth or some other material to, co to cover the seat. The cloth is, it's, has its own supply chain because it, has, it goes to uh, weavers who have to buy certain textile, you have to buy certain from cotton manufacturers, and, and the cotton manufacturers are all over the world. So 
a car that is ma- that is made in Texas, the funny thing may start. Some part may start as a cotton growing up in Texas. Then it will move to China to get textile. Then it will move to uh, you know Bangladesh to start weaving it and cutting it. Then it will move you know to a Johnson Control Factor in Canada to try to put it around a, a seat. And then the seat will move back to the Texas factory. <laughs> it is maybe a stone throw away from the, you know, from the cotton field to put in, into the car. Meanwhile, the cotton and <laughs> parts of the seat were traveling around the world. And then and there are several um, of this supply chain, one for the motors, one for the cloth, one for the basic material. A lot of it is there to make a car. And... The, the unfortunate thing is what we call the golden screw. Out of the 30,000 part, one is missing. There's no car. You cannot make the car. It was the case during a, at the end of the pandemic, Ford Motor Company had a problem. You know, the F-150 truck is the best-selling truck in the United States, made by, by Ford. Uh, small truck, you know, that... Uh, that people use, not, not the big over-the-road trucks. It's a pickup truck, what it is. And they did not have the small ovals that say Ford, the, the, uh, you know, their logo, basically, that they put on, on the front. And they have thousands of trucks stranded, and they couldn't sell them because they didn't have this <laughs> little oval, which has nothing to do with the engine, with the transmission, with the, the, anything. You need everything to be. That's the amazing point. You need everything to be there just in time, just when the car is being put together. Everything has to be there, with people, with machinery, with factories being able to put everything together. So that's once you start understanding the enormity of this. And this is, we just talk about one part. There are so many parts, and each one of them has its own supply chain. So it's uh, so you start to understand how complex it is and how amazing it is. That the car can be sold for only, only quote unquote thirty, forty thousand dollars. It's it's it seems like nothing compared to the activities that bring it together. It's fascinating, and, and one of the examples you gave many of us during the pandemic, or even due to the war in Ukraine, have been impacted by the rising costs of raw materials, for example. And one of the great examples you give that again we just wouldn't even think about is Axo Noble and how their main product, which is paint, has 50 to 60 ingredients alone. People find it okay that the car has 30,000 parts or an airplane has close to a million parts. What is uh, actually, what people find even more amazing is that a diaper, a baby diaper has more than 50 parts. I mean, a modern diaper has more than 50 parts. And by the way, you need all of them. I mean, it's a they, they provide certain certain functionality and work together. And, it's a, almost every product. The reason that at one point in the book I talk about bananas, you report this a chap- the chapter about ba- oh you were you were ready for this one. I didn't have the space in the in the studio to bring in a car or a diaper. I didn't just didn't want to bring a diaper, so I brought a <laughs> banana to kind of illustrate this one. This is a great story. I'd love you to share this. Yeah. So the reason that I talk to explain supply chain, I thought okay. This is way too complicated, way too complex, way too huge. So I said, let's talk about banana. Why banana? Because banana is a product that has only one part, banana. Furthermore, it comes with its own packaging. So you don't need packaging. (laughs) So I try to look at what happens to banana. How do they go from a, a, a field in Costa Rica to a store in... in Boston or somewhere. And it starts by, you know, the first ingredient are water and sun and, uh, you know, good good soil. So the banana grows. Then I describe the process how they cut the bunches and send them over wires to uh, clean them uh, and then put them on trucks and send them to the port in Costa Rica. Then they go on uh, refrigerated ships, they come to the United States, they come to... From there, they'll come to usually the port of, uh, uh, of New Orleans, and then they'll be distributed to various uh, distributors and retailers. The interesting thing is that uh, people think that banana is just a, 
you know, natural fruit. You just buy a banana. What could be more natural than that? People don't realize that it undergo absolutely several industrial processes before you get it. And the reason is the retailers don't want just banana. They want so many green bananas, so many half yellow bananas, so many yellow bananas, because they want to sell it over time and every uh, consumer has its own desire and needs. So actually bananas go to either the distributor or the retailer. They go to a cold warehouses where when, they, when the retailer order, they start putting certain gas into this. And the, depending on the time that the gas in there and the concentration of the gas, they can absolutely control the color of the banana, the ripening of the banana. They actually control the ripening process. And then they get some of them when they are green, some of them when they are half yellow, some of them are three quarters green, <laughs> yellow, some of them are totally yellow, the way the retailer orders this. And then it, go, it, it goes to the store. So understanding that even something as simple as a banana goes to so many processes and so many steps to get to the supermarket shelf. And uh, so it, it's just because it is so simple, it's amazing that it's even that is that complicated. So you start thinking about, my God, something that has 30,000 parts. How did they do it? This is one part. It gives you massive empathy towards buying local and the reason why, what that actually means. You know, when you buy local from a local supplier, the air miles that doesn't happen, all this interdependency that actually happens or, or is, re, is avoided by buying local. That was one of the real big realizations for me. Yes, it's a... However, with a little nuance here, because, for example, flying, um, flying flowers from South America to Boston is better than growing them in Boston. More sustainable, because there is just there's plenty of sun, plenty of water, good, uh, good soil, no problem. They just grow. When you do it in Boston, you have to put it in uh, hot houses. You have to <laughs> there's a lot of processing. And it's very, very energy intensive. So it's, you know, we have to take it with a grain of salt. It's not always local. By and large, yes, but not always. Brilliant, brilliant. And I'm going to share, Yossi, with your permission, the, the score model that you have in the book. And maybe you can talk to this and explain it to the audience. This is the score model, and it's got seven processes. And this really, for me, brought it to life. The process start with the estimating demand, even outside this uh, picture, estimating the demand. Once we know what the demand is, we want to start buying parts, raw material, whatever we need to make it. Then it goes to the transform. It's the, this is the outer, the, the le- on my side, it's the left circle. It's a, you source the, the part, you source the raw material and you transform. You transform into a product or a part or a, a subpart. Then it goes to the orchestrate and then you go to the right hand side. You have, you have the order in hand and you fulfill the demand. But of course, all these processes are managed by prior planning, which is the top circle. And the planning is intended to synchronize, synchronize supply and demand. So you don't have too many parts that nobody wants and you don't have orders that you cannot fulfill. So you have to, the planning goes to synchronize the supply, uh, uh, supply and demand. At the bottom cycle, we have the return. Now you want to, in, um, as much as you can, reduce waste and start regenerating the same, the uh, new product from the remnants of the old product. So you take it back and you move it back to the transform and make a uh, new product. The interesting thing is you can imagine this structure happens along, along a line. There are several companies in, in, along a chain, and it, it happens in each one of them. And they are connected because the source, when you say source on the left side, it's actually, it's the, actually the order from the company on the left. Um, so, and the uh, fulfill on the right hand side is giving the uh, is uh, fulfilling the demand from the company on the right it could be the consumer but mostly if it's in the middle of the chain it's the company on the right so you have this is the chain that you have a group of or a, a line of companies you can imagine uh, this way each doing 
all these processes, each doing the planning, each thinking about the return, the transformation, the fulfillment, the ordering, each orchestrating all these activities. This was brilliant, this diagram, because it changed my thinking about a supply chain, that it's not actually just a linear chain, it's it's a tiered approach. And you talk about there's there's many tiers within the tiers as a as a result of some type of breakdown. And and this key line I thought was so important because when we talk about, you know, the magic of getting the product at the end is so dependent on so many parts of that chain. You say here, a singular dependence involves a risk for the company. Should one supplier fail, multiple suppliers, on the other hand, allow the company to continue production when one supplier fails? We saw that during COVID. But having multiple suppliers increases the management complexity by creating the need to manage, inspect, audit, and negotiate with many more entities. And this, as a result, can lead to tiers within the tiers, sometimes unethical suppliers with the need to deliver results to shareholders or to the organization, people might quickly go and find a new supplier. And that supplier might not have the same ethics as your previous one. Well, several several comments on what you just said. First of all, it's not only increased the complexity, it increases cost. Because if you have, let's let's say the, the ultimate, if you have a single supplier, if you put all your order on one supplier, you'll get a good rate, a good price, because you put a lot of volume. And you actually, with the volume, you actually reduce the cost for the supplier. So you can uh, uh, get some of it. So it's, it's a complexity and, and the cost. But of course, having multiple suppliers will cost more, but reduce the risk. Because you'll have, uh, if, if, if you have one supplier and that supplier fail, you're toast. There's not much that you can do. What you talk about, uh, needing to quickly find another supplier has several other problems. Because we know, some of my research and others, uh, about fakes, about uh, fakes increase dramatically in period of shortages. Because companies do exactly what, what you just described. They quickly try to find another supplier. And when you look at many of the um, recalls that happen with the children toys in, uh, in the last few years, they happened because companies got caught, supplier had a problem, they had to find somebody else, and it was just, the, the, you know, they use paint which has wrong material in it, wrong, uh, uh, wrong component, and things like this that uh, became a problem and they had to do a big recall leading to high cost. So uh, it's always good to be prepared. But here, give you an example of company that I think does it very well. Intel is actually, I do a lot of work with Intel. And Intel, how do you, you know, square the circle? On one hand, you want low cost. On the other hand, you want uh, risk. You want to, to deal with risk mitigation. So it, Intel has, for every product, for every part that they buy, it has five levels of um, what we call resilience. So at level one, they buy some parts and they only have a study of who are the other suppliers in this business all over the world. Who makes, who also makes this? We buy from one, but who makes? Level two, they go and they try out one or two of them. Level three, they go and make a run from one of them. Level four, they try to do repeated runs. So they see if there's you know, consistency with, from the other supplier. Level five, they actually use two suppliers. So they're always, in every one of the products, they kind of move between depending on the perception of risk and depending on the outside world. Suddenly there's a war with Ukraine. Oh, some product may move from two to three to four because they try to get other. So, so they try to have their cake and eat it too, but I think that's a very, a very clever approach. Yeah, you, you say in the book as well, the chains are so long and have so many organizations involved that the parties can only estimate and typically can't know for sure what's going on at the far ends of the chain. Uh, and you say, for example, here, I thought this was so interesting that seemingly unrelated disruptions like COVID taught us a shortage of gas in Europe, for example, due to war can create ex unexpected impacts like a shortage of food in Africa. Maybe you have some examples of that. That's a, another problem with the lower tier of the supply chain when you have just commodities. So, um, Many commodities are used in multiple products. Think about oil. Think about wheat. Think about every commodity you think of is not used in one product. And when you have 
shortage in in a, in certain area it it, it impacts other it, it give you a, give you an example uh, an opposite example it says during covid um, automobile manufacturers stop ordering chips they were make they don't making car nobody was buying cars so they stop ordering chips at the same time of course people use laptop and cameras and zoom they all need chips so all the chip companies started selling, started uh, having contracts with the technology companies. Oh, COVID was starting to, you know, we keep coming out of COVID, and people start looking at cars again. The car companies they said, ah, we need chips again. They said, oops, not only we don't have, but we have long-term contract with entirely different industry. We can't give you the chips. So uh, it's hard to think. All, all the connection is I mean, hard to imagine sometimes. I mean, none of the other companies imagine that they're in competition with, uh, you know, Dell computers. What do they have to do with each other? Well, they use the same chips. I mean, <laughs> so it's a there are component that goes in every that go in, in in many many products, and it's true with chemicals. It's true with many many commodities. You know, one of the things I thought was so interesting for this show for many of our audience, Yossi, are people who work in innovation or new product development, etc. And say, for example, you're a head of innovation in an organization, and you're trying to force through a new idea or a new product, etc. This is often why it gets blocked this supply chain and introducing new supply chain and how difficult it is to manage the business already, or all the scenarios that you have to plan for in supply chain. Yet, somebody who doesn't understand it until they've read your book, and hopefully listen to this series, goes, oh, okay, now I totally understand it. Because you, you, when you don't understand what's actually going on behind the, behind the, the front stage, you, you have no empathy for it. Yes, you have no empathy. And you think that uh, everybody who, uh, who start raising issues is just, you know, backwards, doesn't, like, doesn't want innovation. Does Look, there's nobody more than supply chain managers who are crying for help all the time. <laughs> they are the first people in many cases to adopt technology, sometimes the wrong technology, but they all, nobody knows better than supply chain manager how complex and difficult the issues are. So, look, there was a, the whole move, for example, with blockchain. Turned out it was not the panacea that everybody was hoping for, but lots of companies, the American FedEx and other big companies, started testing them immediately, see, well, well, maybe it will help. Maybe we can get, uh, we can start trusting more what we get, the information and all this. Did not quite uh, pan out, but it shows the hunger that people have. The, uh, the, the, the tasks are so complex that people are looking for help. But uh, on the other hand, people who come usually from outside the profession and try to, su to suggest solutions, find out the solutions don't quite work. For example, why blockchain don't work? One of the reasons, it is slow. So people think, oh, we can do, you know, 10 operations a second. In supply chain, you need to do a million operations a second. Just, <laughs> just to be, uh, you know, to, uh, to be on top. So you have to understand the scale of these monsters in order to understand what will work, what doesn't work. Solution, point solution, that don't work at scale are usually meaningless for supply chain. You need to work at scale. So, you know, people are hesitant. There's also another thing. When, uh, when you're in marketing and somebody comes to you and suggests a new, I don't know, AI system to target your marketing better, great, it's a nice innovation, may even work or don't. But if it doesn't work, the company doesn't stop. If the supply chain doesn't work, the company goes out of business. That's not, <laughs> it's not for the faint of heart to stop the movement of uh, product to your customers because that's what it does. You're not going to be able to supply the product. So you have to take it seriously. <laughs> you have to make sure that everything works. So, uh, so also by nature, I should say, many logistics operators are cautious. In the sense, when you operate large ships and large craners and trucks, and, or you work in factories that use hazardous material, you know, mistakes can be costly. 
it's a, and can be issue with with lives and limb so people are cautious it's a, a you fly airplane you drive big trucks you drive big ships you're not uh, frivolous you, <laughs> you know the lives in your hands so it's just the nature of the beast it's so so important this book for for even realizing the the challenge of a supply chain manager and their teams and you know I, I used to always have a huge empathy for a cto chief technology officer trying to bring in new technology from an old it system because oftentimes if they have a seat at the board table they get all they get is 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 grief from their colleagues why isn't it done quick enough and so do supply chain managers and now i understand why but i thought we'd we'd shift to a different area that you talk about as well these are insights sorry one comment about it supply chain managers were victims of their own success supply chain manager got so good and the complexity was so hidden even from the ceo of their own company that uh, when suddenly things became very difficult, prices were going up, suddenly costs were high and all these people were attacking them. What is it you don't do your job? It, it's just not understand what it took to control the complexity and the reach of, of, of modern supply chain. So in that sense, it's like uh, driving on, a, on asphalt on the road. If everything is fine, you don't even think about it. But you only think about it when something doesn't work. That's also chief technology officer, same thing. You know, if everything is worked smoothly and all this, eh, nobody, nobody even talks to them. I call it the referee effect. You know, a referee for a, a football game, no, nobody cares if a ref has a good game. <laughs> they, they, expect, they expect that just to happen, but everybody gives them grief. Of course, it's a good, a good I, I'll use this, this term. Yeah, please do. Of course, of course, I, of course, I'll have to explain what football really is. But anyway, well, I say football because that can be whatever football is in your country, whoever is listening to us. <laughs> I see. But um, I, I thought we'd shift to a different area that you talked about. Again, huge insights for me, eye opening insights, because you share insights about outsourcing and offshoring and how countries like China and Japan require firms to use domestically owned partners, domestically, domestically manufactured goods or domestically supplied services in order to operate in their, econo their economies. Now, again, somebody who doesn't understand will go, oh, yeah, well, let's just get it built in China. It's way cheaper. There, and th then there's the whole IP problem that goes on here as well. Property transfer to local companies. This was eye opening for me. I'd love you to share this. You're talking about why people went to China or why people are living want to leave China? <laughs> why why they went in the first place and then why they want to leave? Okay, in the first place, decades ago, people went to China for low labor cost. China offered the low labor cost, and today people are still going to China, but they're going to China because they have the best infrastructure of the world, the best trains and roads and airports, and better than anywhere else. Uh, new and working. Uh, they have a good university who turn out good engineers, who turn out, you know, work in good companies, who are innovative. And, and you have the Chinese government, in many cases, behind their Chinese champions until they get too big and then the government controls it. But, but, but China is also, Chinese are entrepreneurs by nature. And uh, lots of good companies are coming out of uh, existing China. For example, China is now leading the world in electric vehicles. The new crop of electric vehicles are mind-boggling. They are good. They're not just uh, the tin boxes that we used to think about Chinese cars that uh, nobody wanted. They are actually good and good-looking and good cars. Uh, so, first of all, China is becoming really a manufacturing powerhouse, also for you know, advanced technologies. Uh, second, China is a huge market. And the more nationalistic they become, the more you have to produce in this market. So now let's talk about currently when people are trying to leave China. So the result of what we just said is that companies invested billions of dollars, literally, in decades in building entire supply chain in China because they understood that you don't just have a supplier. That supplier needs another supplier, needs a supplier, needs a supplier. The whole chain has to be created and has to 
teach them how to manage this and how to do it. They became good at it. And there are so all supply chain in China. So even many companies under uh, political pressure are leaving China. They're not really leaving China. They put the final assembly in Vietnam, but the entire oh, 99% of the value is still in China because all the suppliers, all the materials, all the parts are still coming from China. But they can put a label made in Vietnam, not in China. That is to satisfy some, uh, you know, political uh, requirement, get out of China, especially in the U.S. It's starting to change now, and companies, uh, mostly, it's not for, for political. Companies are afraid that China will do what Russia did to, uh, to Taiwan, and then, it, uh, then the, uh, the world will be, will be cut in two. Because just like Russia, there, there are literally no direct trade relationship between the West and Russia, whether it's Europe, the United States, Canada, what have you. There are really no, everything was cut. Now, I, for example, I'm, I'm flying to China next week, and it used to be a 12-hour flight, now it's a 16-hour flight, because you cannot fly over Russia. So you have to, you, so you have to go around. I mean, that's, that's a real, <laughs> real implication of all, of, of, of all these things that we just read in the paper about. Um, so if something like this happened with China, that will be much, China economic power is much, much bigger than Russia. Uh, we, can do, we can deal without Russia. It's very hard to, <laughs> to, to live without China. It's, uh, they still hold, there are certain areas, material, that they are controlled the vast amount of um, production in the world, even things like aluminum. Uh, China is a huge source of aluminum, so, but there are other places that have aluminum. Australia has a lot of aluminum, others, but China has most of the smelters. They build smelters like there's no tomorrow. So even if you get the, the, uh, the aluminum from, from Australia, most of, most of it goes to China to be processed and then goes somewhere else. So it's, uh, it's not easy to leave China. Add to this, again, we go geopolitical here, but add to this the fact that the, a country that is missing the boat is Mexico. Mexico could have been the next China, but the anti-business attitude of uh, AMLO, the current, uh, the current president, they're losing historic opportunity because they sit right next to the United States, good universities, lots of people, lots of gangs that can, that if you give them work, they're not going to go to sell cocaine, they can sell automobile parts, so, or whatever, um, and we're just not doing this. I mean, the, the, the Mexicans are, business is still moving to Mexico, despite everything, but it could be a tidal wave without it. Because you mentioned aluminium, I, I just wanted to grasp onto that, because I, I thought that was fascinating, that this shiny white metal, it's found in everything from beverage can to engine blocks to rockets. And on the planet, you tell us this fact. Wait till you get a load of this. As of 2020, producers worldwide make eight kilograms or 18 pounds of aluminium per person on Earth. That's how important that is as a, as a, as a um, textile. Yes. Yes, it's a it's crucial element. It is strong. It is light, and uh, uh, it's some. It over time, maybe in the next, I don't know, decades. It, it's some of it is replaced by um, all kind of fibers. There are airplanes that are made with a certain kind of fibers, but again, there's no no way to run because these fibers require certain. Um, material to bond, bonding agents, the, the material for them is in China. So it's, <laughs> it's just, it's very hard. Look, the basic issue is the following. In the West, we are not doing the trade-off, I would say, smartly, because we are all environmentalists. All think, oh, global warming, my God. And so, for example, we have rare earth material. China is, I don't know, 90%, uh, huge percentage of the uh, production of the world of rare earth material that go into EV, that go into, uh, you know, advanced defense system, going to advanced cars, going to it. 
Now, you know which country has more rare earth in the ground than China? The United States. Only we don't mine it because we are, because of environmental issue, we don't give license to, for mining. Uh, okay, so now we don't, the problem is in many sectors, let's talk about government, uh, but others as well, there's no system thinking. We cannot have two, we don't hold two thoughts at the same time. We need national security, we need good environment. Okay, we cannot just say environment rules. Cannot, because then we give up something that we care dearly about. Um, I don't want to live under Chinese rule. Um, you know, I'm willing even to have some problems and be a little hotter not to live under Chinese rule. Um, we need to balance a lot of unpleasant choices in some sense. And we tend not to do it because politicians like to pretend that they're only good choices. And sometimes there are no good choices. They, they, you know, what do you do here? Uh, I like to breathe fresh air and, and drink clean water just like the next guy. But as I said, I also like to have, you know, EVs. I also like to have, you know, I also like to make sure that the next, or F-35, or whatever, the next uh, U.S. Air Force jet is not powered by Chinese chips. I mean, let's say, how do we do it? We have to square this uh, circle somehow. One of the things that came to mind when you were talking about China, for example, and the power now from the outsourcing and offshoring over the years was in the innovation realm, we talk about examples like Dell Computer and all that was really doing was they were being boxed locally or, or uh, kind of orchestrated from a business finance perspective. And the ship of Theseus, that's kind of, you don't know what's the original ship anymore. There was a show, uh, Yossi, on TV in over these parts of the world called Only Fools and Horses. And there was a guy, a character in it called Trigger. And this guy had a broom. And he's like, oh, this broom is amazing. It's like a, a sweeping brush. I've had it for years. I've changed the head 10 times and I've changed the handle <laughs> 20 times. You know, And and I, you know, you think about the idea of what's the original product here? Who's what's the product? And this is a, a problem for many organizations who have outsourced to China, and then China turn around. And this has happened many organizations, and they go the the initial supply chain uh, part supplier decides actually we don't need them anymore. We can do this ourselves. And this has happened to a lot of businesses. Well, because China insisted on. Um either that you want to make something in China, you have to partner with a Chinese company, and um, or you, you give IP. I, I'm work, I do a lot of work with uh, Moderna, you know, remember from the vaccine? They're around my office, or right next to my office is, is, is Moderna. Moderna had a contract, billions of dollars contract with China in order to sell the, the Moderna vaccine in China. The one hitch. The Chinese say, we need the recipe for how to make it. And Moderna says, that's not going to happen. And they move away from doing this. This was, a, they said, we can't do it because, yeah, you'll buy the first batch and then you'll make it yourself. <laughs> it's not going to happen. We're not going to do it. So, yes, the, it, but let me, you know, we talk a lot about China. And there's something amazing about China that we should not forget. In 1978, China joined the World Trade Organization. At that point, 99% of Chinese were living in awful poverty. In a few decades, China took 800 million people and moved them to the middle class. That's a humanitarian achievement on an unimaginable scale. Nobody else was able to do it. Africa didn't do it. South America didn't do it. Nobody did it. In anywhere close to this uh, time. So one has to moderate any criticism of, of China because they did some amazing things. And if you think about, if you measure success in how many people don't die and don't live in poverty and, and all this in massive, massive numbers. So that's why I'm always saying one has to recognize this. Yeah, we have to forget sometimes about profits and profit making because that's often what it's about, really. It's about the bottom line and the bottom line 
should need to be something else, as you say, you know, how people are living in poverty, etc. There was a really, really interesting part here. You, you mentioned about growing flowers locally versus in a different part of the world and greenhouses, etc. I mean, you, you don't want to be you don't want to be growing bananas in Ireland, put it that way. <laughs> but, uh, one of the things you remind us about here is Adam Smith's absolute advantage and then David Ricardo's comparative advantage. And this was really helpful to understand why one country would favor importing one product and exporting another. This was fascinating. And the concept of absolute advantage is relatively easy. I mean, one country is better at making one thing, another country is better better make another thing instead of every country making its own one very efficiently and one, you know, losing money on it, they trade. This is the essence of absolute advantage. Ricardo showed that it's actually better to trade, even better to trade, even when one country has all the advantages. And by the way, we see it. China has a lot of advantages right now. They're one of the biggest trading countries in the world. I mean, it's a, uh, for many years, the United States has you know, all the advantages. The uh, United States during the Clinton administration, not that far, had the, uh, you know, surplus of, uh, of money, of, of trade, of everything. But it kept trading because it made sense. Uh, in the book, there are numerical examples to demonstrate why, why it is so. I don't want to go, it's hard to go over them, you know, uh, on the air. But uh, trading makes sense. Unless politicians get involved, and start putting trade barriers, and start selling it as if we are punishing China, not realizing you are actually punishing U.S. or Western consumer when we put up uh, trade barriers. Um, and one one understands the um, the impetus to do it. Uh, it's politically experienced in the short term. Ah, do something about our workers, our staff, protect our workers. No, you don't. You actually make everybody worse off. So you have to manage it. You can, uh, there are many, many ways of managing it. And by the way, it's in- interesting. The European Union, um, something that many consumers, managers in the United States don't pay attention to because we have such aversion to uber governments, you know, <laughs> control and unelected really and, and, and control everything. Um, But they come up with some good concepts. And uh, they talk about, for for example, they talk about how, they talk about the fifth industrial revolution, how people and machines have to work together and all this. It's absolutely the the challenge of the next generation, of the the coming generation. So uh, uh, in terms of um, worrying about sustainability, for example, when the European does the border adjustment, that's a, that's a European concept. That just so we say, how do we put something on our our manufacturers? Well, we give advantage to China uh, or to America. They, they don't want to do it, so we do. We, we adjust them. When something comes, we put a tariff on this. The problem is this: when every tariff begets a counter tariff, people feel they must respond. So it started deteriorating, and we less and less trade, and everybody's worse off at the end. So I, the idea was good. I just don't think it will work, <laughs> so, because China is not going to sit quietly and, and let the EU put, or an America certainly is not going to. Congress will never agree to this, to do, uh, to put the, for example, France will put, or EU in general will put tariff on American goods. So the next stage will be. French cheese and, and, and French wine and, and German cars and everything that you can think of will have, we'll have a tariff on this. And then the European responded. The United, it's, it's a bad cycle. We, we have Guinness here in Ireland. <laughs> but, but, you know, they, they have a different Guinness in Africa as well, which is actually produced locally. It tastes totally different. But one of the, you mentioned there about, like, for example, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, they use value added to measure contribution to a product. That was an interesting concept as well. They wanted to show that you don't have to uh, export finished goods in order to uh, to actually do, do very well. And they said the problem is the metric, the measurement system, because the measure system of uh, GDP 
uh, gross domestic product, is looking at only product, only finished product. How much you make, how much you export, how much you consume. They said, no, 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 no. If you also look at, if you actually charge the value that you add to intermediate products, so you just make, you just bought something, bought some raw material, you made some part and you sell it to somebody else who make a sub-assembly out of this. You added value here. It doesn't show up in the GDP. So they try to measure the value added. Like, in fact, like value added tax. I mean, they try to show what value was added along the way. And they said, and there are examples in the book, I even mentioned example of countries, I don't remember now, that uh, in the, uh, with, with the old, old metrics, we're not doing well, but once you take this into account, you see they're really doing very well. So a, a lot of it was the measurement system, not so much the operation. There's a couple of great examples. I'd lo- and please pick pick one, or if you want to talk about them all, but the, I love these examples in the book. So we have, many of our audience are in the US and Canada, so they will know the well-known breakfast cereal, Grape Nuts. So that was a victim of complexity breakdown. Then there was also Marmageddon, you talked about as well, <laughs> for Marmite lovers. And then finally, there was the, the whole complexity of a T-shirt, a basic T-shirt, and the supply chain of that. So maybe you, you want to pick one of those, whichever your favorite is. Well, I, there was a very famous book, Travels of a T-Shirt, not by me. Excellent book. It follows what happens to, what is the, the, the journey from the cotton fields to a finished shirt, T-shirt. She tried, the, the, the author, the woman, tried to show how can it even possible that you go through the you cross the world several times you cross continents and a t-shirt is sold for two bucks for two dollars which means that the manufacturing is 50 cents maybe uh how can it be so efficient and so and and so complex and efficient uh, you know at the same time and so all the processes go to and how everybody is so good at what they do with this the the weaving and the textile and the cutting. Now, the result is that some labor-intensive operation like cutting and sewing can be done only in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh by women who are actually exploited. And uh, that's, that's an unfortunate time because if you are serious and think about a T-shirt that in the United States you buy for $12 a pack of six, really, that's, that's the T-shirt that you buy. It's nothing. How much did the woman who sit in Sri Lanka and sewing it day in and day out was making? Uh, she probably couldn't live with this. It's, it's, it's really awful. She was trying to show also some of the social side of, of what's involved in this overly cheap product and how much waste in them, how much they are being, you know, there's a whole another issue of uh, waste in, in, in clothing. You know, when you go to, what is my, the, the, the store, Primark, you see people, they're buying in mountains of, uh, of products, very cheap. They last for a while and then they thrown away. I mean, the waste is ridiculous. If you think about it, very little of it is gets actually, you know, circulated and, 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 and gets back, back into production. So it's... Um, There's a whole, of course, we come back to other issue, but there's a whole story about the, the, the uh, conspicuous consumption. I mean, we buy much more than we need and, uh, and waste much more, <laughs> waste food. Food in the United States, about 40% of this is, is wasted. 40% of the food, it's, it's just thrown away. And, and you know what's the unfortunate thing? A large part of it is because of the legal system. So... True case. We just went, but three years ago, I went with my wife to a, a, a store that it sell. It, it's a restaurant, but they also sell a lot of, um, you know, cookies and bagels and stuff like this. So we come at the end of the day and we see them. They we come. They they close at like nine p.m. and we're just next to MIT at nine. We just walk walk into the store. And we see, and they, they want to give us for free, you know, bagels and cookies, all, all kind of baked goods. And then we see them taking large waste basket and just throwing it away. 
the whole thing. And that's why don't you give it to, uh, you know, homeless shelters? Why don't you give it to, you know, people who need food? They said, because if something is wrong in one of them, we'll, give, we'll be sued and we will lose. So we don't, we cannot take the risk. And sometimes it's just nothing lost. People just say that they, you know, got a tummy ache from eating one of our stuff and they'll sue. And there'll be some lawyers who will take the sue on contingency fee and we will lose. So we just throw it away. And the, the amount that gets thrown away are mind-boggling. So it's, it's a whole lot of things. Some of it is just inefficiency. Some of it is just letting food, you know, expire. Sometimes the expiration date is also a risk management issue because most of the food that expires after, you know, three days, you can still eat it. I mean, it's, it's not, but people are overcautious and say, oh, this, this, you know, food can last only so much and then there's expiration date. You know, we throw it away. A lot of this is uh, problematic. Yeah, we, we have a, a company here in Ireland. I'll give them a shout out. They're a B Corp they're called Food Cloud. And that's what they do. They work with Tesco and all these big retailers to take the food and expir- expiry date and give it to, in some cases, shelters, etc., and homeless people in order to, to move. But you, don't, you, you see what they do? They take on the risk from Tesco. Tesco doesn't have the risk anymore. So Tesco is fine. And they are a company that's really an NGO, it's a B Corp, so they are less exposed than the big pocket, bad, big bad Tesco. And even if they go to, let's say, the, the United States contest, even if they go to a trial, they'll be a very sympathetic defender. Tesco will not. Tesco will be the big bad company. So Tesco is okay with giving it to somebody else who then distributes it. That's fine. Um, why there are not too many of those in the United States? I don't know. There are some, but very small. Well, they can get in touch with Food Cloud, one of our great Irish success stories. I, I thought we, a couple of last things, if that's okay. One is um, to bring it to a business level. So we often talk about leaders in business, etc. Uh, a kind of a hero who ran Ford for a long time was CEO Alan Mulally. And you tell us in the book that as the financial crisis was ravaging companies in 2008, Mulally made an impassioned plea to the United States Congress for a government bailout to save his fiercest competitors. So you're kind of going, what? Would he not like them to disappear? But he argued here that, that more than 90% of Ford's suppliers also serve GM and Chrysler. He explained, should one of the other domestic companies declare bankruptcy, the effect on Ford's production and operations would be felt within days, if not hours. I thought that was such an incredible insight. He had the congressional testimony. I gave I, in the book. I quote from the congressional testimony. He, he, you know, begged the government to save his competitors because, it's as, as you said, they, they use many, or most of the same suppliers, and if the, the suppliers need the volume, they cannot make money just with one, uh, one producer, you know, one uh, original equipment manufacturer, one car company. They need all of them because to get to get volume he said you must you must save my competitors it's a by the way Ellen Mulally was a legendary leader he was he turned around the Boeing he was CEO of Boeing before that turned Boeing around he was a real ah there's stories about him he was a real visionary businessman who understood that you don't optimize for profit you optimize for quality and um, uh, a lot of other, uh, and then profit follows. You don't you don't optimize for profit. He yeah, there's a a movie a, a book called Car, uh, and there are many many uh, you know stories story about him how he changed the the uh, the culture in Ford when people were the, the partner were competing with each other. For example, one one quick story. He um, Every management meeting, they're the, the, the head of all the department. So first of all, you say, enough with your assistant making the presentation. You make the presentation. Because everybody bought the chief of staff for, you know, for manufacturing, for supply chain, for procurement, for uh, finance, for marketing. Second, he said, always all the news were good. Everybody was giving report. The news was good. He said, everybody is doing well, but we are losing money. How can it be? And then one of the... Uh, head of department, at one point, 
showed the dashboard, it was all red. He said, we didn't meet this quota, we are losing here, we are losing here, we are losing here. The people around the table were already distributing his job and his bonus. They thought he's gone. Ellen Mulali said there, listen, 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 and started clapping hands. And this guy became the CEO after, after Ellen Mulali. He said, finally, we get somebody to tell you, now we can fix it. Because if everything is good, there's nothing to fix. And yet the company is losing money. So uh, Ellen Mulali was a, a legendary leader. Yeah, I, I, lo- I love the stories of Mulali. W- one last thing, I thought we'd conclude part one with the people. So we touched on this earlier on about the empathy for people in supply chain, supply chain managers being victims of their success. But you, you look at the people behind the supply chain. So for example, the great driver resignation. And one of the things I thought so interesting was when, when you see a driver, and maybe you're the guilty party here that keep them waiting for a long time, you think maybe they're not leaving because they're on the road for a long time. But that's not the case, you say at all. That's not why most drivers resign from their jobs as drivers. And, and this also touches into what we'll talk about in the future about if there's a huge amount of, say, US people who work in driving, and AI is coming down the line, that's going to present whole new challenges as well for the world. This is research done in my, in my center at MIT. We show that driver quit because they're treated badly, because they come to, a, to unload the truck and they have to wait for three, four hours. They're not getting paid for this time. That's the problem. They are not employees. They, they, get, they get paid by the, by the mile. They don't drive. They don't get paid. So it's not that they want to wait. And on, on top of this, they're treated badly. They're not allowed to use the bathroom. They're not allowed to have a cup of coffee in some places. Not, of course, in uh, not everywhere. So this, this is all issue. Where can people find out more about you? You're, you're, you have a huge following on, on social media. You also have lots of talks. You give talks all over the world as well. You mentioned you're going to China, uh, vi- not via Russia, around, <laughs> around Russia. But where's the best place to reach out and find you? First of all, I'm uh, anybody want to contact me, I'm uh, my email is Sheffi, my last name, S A G F F I at MIT.edu. Uh, you, you, you know, um, Sheffi.mit.edu will just get you to my website. My website has all my articles, all my book, all my talks, all everything you wanted and didn't want to know about me. It's a brilliant book to understand it. For a novice like me, it's an absolute gem of a book. The book is The Magic Conveyor Belt, Supply Chains, AI, and the Future of Work. And our guest, Professor Yossi Sheffi, I'm very grateful. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. And we'll see you soon, Beth.